Hello out there and welcome to the Revere Veterans and Community Show. Today we have a special guest. We also have a lot of special guests, but this one is more than just special. He's best to come on our show. His name is Dr. Randy Bach. Thank you. Dr. Randy Bach, before we start, you are a graduate from Yale University, and that's, believe it, in New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah, that's where, that's where it was when I last left it. I, Tell uh, us about how you first got interested in medicine and uh, to, become, to go to the university. Well, uh, medicine started for me when I was young. Um, I was uh, about five years old at day camp, and I was on a, uh, a wagon uh, with a, it's like a horse wagon, and I just happened to have this in my hand, but you know, those things that, that yoke the horses, and right. it was on a pivot, and a bunch of us, like Iwo Jima, we were holding the, this bar up, so a bunch of us kids were holding the bar up, and then the bell rang, it was only day camp, so the bell rang, and everyone jumped off, and I was holding the thing, and I wanted to let it down easy, and... <laughs> And my thumb was right there, and, and the, the bar came down. That whole big wood thing came down. It, it slid off my thumb. And, um, and so it was in two pieces, pretty much, and they wanted to just amputate. Uh, my mother, this was up in upstate New York, so my mother, she raced up and grabbed me and brought me to her uh, friend down in New York City, Manhattan. And uh, he was actually an ENT. He wasn't even a plastic surgeon, per se, but he got a team together, and they... Um, put my thumb back. You can't really tell which one it is, and it was this one, and scarless and whatever. So I had this cast on for a while. I didn't really think about it. When it came off, I had the thumb back, and, and it, um, you know, I remember it, it's coming off, and so I was just so amazed that I could have my, my hand back together, and it's like, I want to be a doctor. And uh, I might have wanted to be like five other things, a fireman and policeman and all that other stuff at that age, but my mother kind of like hooked onto that when she's like, oh, and as I got older and I thought about being other things, she kept saying, but remember the promise you made that you wanted to help other people in that situation, yours? And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it kind of it stuck. And, and I mean, there are other things I've thought about along the way, and, and uh, who knows how many other things I'll get to. But uh, I, I kept with it uh, through college and then medical school and, and beyond. And they, uh, you know something? When you talk about your thumb being cut off or something, when I was a kid, there was a movie, maybe you heard of it, maybe even called Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. And he had body parts put together to make this gigantic monster. Mm -hmm. We laughed. We, that would never happen. But t today, they put, do put body parts together. Well, yeah, it, I mean, Frankenstein's not the monster. Frankenstein's the doctor. Okay. A lot of people make the con confusion. There's Frankenstein's monster, and then there's Dr. Frankenstein. Right. But, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, uh, you know, I, I think they're, you know, he probably gets a bad rap because of his crazy monster. But, you know, the original book was a little different from the movie. You know, Would you explain it to us? Because I, oh, I did, geez, that was in college. Miss Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and it was a lot more humanistic than than the kind of the monster movies right. come out to be. But certainly, you know, there are aspects of that where we can, um, you know, not make Frankenstein's, but but rehabilitate, you know, and and get parts for other for people. You know, I mean, they're talking about cochlear implants for hearing. And there are ways, you know, to bring hearing to people who've never heard before. Um, obviously, you know, on a very simple basis, you know, a lot of people get cataracts removed. You know, they're going blind and they can see clearly again. And radial keratotomies and, and their liver transplants, potentially lung transplants. Obviously, we've heard about heart transplants. I have a good friend who uh, has lived uh, probably almost uh, well, 25 years now with a heart transplant. And at the time that he had to put in, the life expectancy for that transplant would probably only have been about seven or eight years. And, and lo and behold, you know, they've, they've managed to, you know, make so much advances on the immunotherapy part of it and to get you not to reject your transplants that he's, he's living and doing fine, seemingly. And uh, obviously, there are advances along the way across the board. You know, we haven't obliterated all illnesses, obviously. And people, are, you know, one simple irony, if I can I continue? Go right ahead. Well, one simple irony is that as we have a lot of these medical successes, the average age of the population goes up. And so, you know, I, I know you're, you're what, 35? You're close, but you're up by 50 years, but going the other way. Thank you, <laughs> so, so, And you look great, but, but the fact of the matter is we live more of our lives away from those kind of like young, healthy years of between, you know, 15 and 35, which are our maximum strength years. So as a proportion, as we have more medical success, oddly enough, the, the years when we're incredibly robust becomes a smaller percentage of our overall life. So we wind up having, 
even as we get more successful medically, we wind up thinking we're not necessarily as successful because we're taking more pills as we get older that are keeping us going or more contraptions, more you know, surgeries and that kind of stuff. So it's a little bit of an irony. It's sometimes hard to keep people satisfied with the situation when in fact their longevity has increased vastly over the decades. I'd like to say something to you, Dr. Randy Buck. When I was a young man, 40 years, maybe 50 years was considered a b uh, elderly, right. old. Right. Now we just had a gentleman the other day, God bless him, a gentleman by the name, uh, I hope you're listening, Sal Santoro, a World War II veteran, celebrated 100 years, 100 wow. years, February the 4th. Well, I salute you, Mr. Santoro. Uh, right. And I salute our other veteran. Thank you. Right Thank here, you. Mr. Morris. So we have Sal Santoro, you know, who's 100 years old. Today, people live up in the 80s and the 90s. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're actually at my house. We're, uh, um, we're taking in my mother-in-law. You know, my mother, my mother just passed uh, last October at night. How old was she? She was 92. That's quite a good age. And she, she frankly did the whole gamut. She lived in her own. She had her own apartment and her own. She did her own affairs, her own checkbook right till the end. And um, you know, it's I'm sad that she's not with us, but she had she had the full the full ride. I, I tell people. So she had no regrets and no remorse. And um, my mother-in-law is in a similar situation. She's a little bit younger, but not that much. And she's um, seeming, I mean, I, we haven't done the final details, but she's going to be coming to live with us. Um, and we have a little apartment made up for her downstairs at my house. And so, you know, I, I understand the, the both ends of uh, the life spectrum. And we, you know, certainly have a lot to give and be thankful for to our, you know, older Right, but yeah. now the, a lot of the elderly people like to remain in their own homes. They oh, insofar as they can, absolutely. Right, and people come around, I don't know what you call, I guess helpers you call them, or they have a name for them, I don't know what it is. Yeah, they, home health aides. Right, and that home kind of health stuff. aides, right. Yeah, well, some people like that, some people don't. In the case of my mother-in-law, she could. she's living up in Maine, and she could stay there, um, and she's also been suggested to go to a nursing home. She doesn't She's actually thinking more about the nursing home than about having home health aid. She's right. a little mistrustful or whatever. So the, the ideal is to have uh, family with you if you can, if you can arrange it. Um, so she wants to come to be with my wife, who's a fabulous, wonderful human being I, I barely deserve. And, um, <laughs> and How long have you been married? I've way? been married, let's see, uh, 23 years. 64 this week. Wow, congratulations. Yep. 64 yeah. years. Beautiful. I got to tell you, it's nice though, Doc, and I'll tell you why. You come home at night, your cooking is done. Your laundry is done. Lots of love and hugging and kissing. Absolutely. And then I realized I was in the wrong house. <laughs> 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 I know I got that joke though, would you? <laughs> you like that, yeah, huh? Yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> you can have it. Yeah. It's all yours. I got to ask you this here. Elderly people like myself. We get tired fast. I know because we're not supposed to exert ourselves and do things like that. And I just want to ask you a question. Shoveling is not a good idea for elderly. Am I correct on that? Well, I'm going to stay away from that kind okay. of topic right now. Good. Then I got another good sure. question for you. I love animals. And this has nothing to do with medicine or anything. A lot of times when I go to the VA hospital or other nursing home, people bring pets in. Are pets really good for the people? I mean, I think we, I think, I think, how would, you know, how would th you th there's almost a symbiosis, uh, you know, a, a, a joining between um, dogs and humans. I mean, I, I, there are actual symbiotic. I don't know what you mean by. Well, I'm symbiotic means one animal kind of built for the other. Like oh. there's some remora, which is a little like a plicostoma, a little kind of suckhead fish that, that sits on top of a whale. And they're a little bit like the guys who paint the Tobin Bridge. Yep. You know, they never get done painting the Tobin Bridge. As soon as they finish one end of it, then the, the other end's all needing paint that again. Do, right. Well, the remora is like that on the whale. He's sitting there and, and cleaning the whale, cleaning all the algae off the whale. And he's eating that stuff. So the whale's happy because the whale's getting skin treatment. He's getting his skin cleaned. And the remora is happy because he's got a meal. He never has to go anywhere. He never has to shop. So he just sits on the whale. So each whale has a, has a remora. Anyway, that, that's kind of classic symbiosis, which means living together. Yeah, and, and dogs may very well be our symbiotic mate. And, and people are, are curious about that. A lot of, you know, kind of zoological anthropologists are curious about whether we are made for dogs and vice versa. Because dogs have a, a particular 
sensibility for aiding us. And, and, and now we have, uh, you know, closed circuit camera and television. We got cell phones. We all have all kinds of awareness things. But back in our more tribal outdoors uh, era, you know, th there's no better security than a dog. A dog understands you. A dog know where, know, knows where you are. A dog bonds with you. A dog will put his own life out for you. Right. And so when you have a tribe or something like that, if you have dogs, well, you, you're pretty much okay. Even if they're asleep, they'll, you know, they'll have a sensibility and a, uh, a smell and so forth, and they'll be much more aware. So clearly we use them, you know, in security situations, even abroad in, in, the, in the theaters of war in the Middle East, Afghanistan and whatnot. Right, you know, yeah. And we also have bomb-sniffing dogs, but on a very human basis. You know, I, th I think people react to the outward. They, they, when they see a dog, they can have a better conversation because the dog's there. It's like a triangulation. Sometimes people have a hard time approaching each other in a direct way, making eye contact. Whatever. When there's a dog there, everyone can kind of like love the dog together. So it, it, it kind of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I tell you, the best, one of the best things I ever did um, was get dogs when my boys were growing up. And, and it, uh, you know, it was just an opening up of conversation and, and stimulation. And, and you hear like that loving voice that, uh, kind of like the mother's voice when they see a little baby, their voice goes up a few notches, like, oh, my God, a little baby. And at any rate, the, the, when, when people are around dogs, they get that kind of nurturing voice. And I think when, when you bring that kind of behavior out, it's wonderful. So if, insofar as you can, yeah, pets are great. Okay, that's good to know out yeah. there. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> I got a couple of questions for you. I understand you have a practice of Revere. Yes. Would I, you tell us about sure that? Sure thing. Um, I am a medical doctor. I do general practice. Um, and I've been, uh, I graduated about 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, from the University of Rochester. And so you're uh, about 51, 52? No, I'm 57. Thank oh. you, though. I appreciate it. And, okay. um, you can pay me later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I went to, um, after medical school, uh, a little bit of the residency roulette, I wound up in, in Massachusetts, and I have uh, did some general practice clinics and so forth before finding an opportunity here in 1987. I was um, rotating through some other hospitals through Lynn Hospital, excuse me, some clinics, and they, ha they had opened the Medical Treatment Center of Revere slightly prior, maybe 86, and they weren't really making a financial go of it, and I took it over, and I've been running it pretty much ever since. So I've been here 27 years in a row, and I, pretty much no missed days, and it's been my own office. So it says Medical Treatment Center Revere, but it's pretty much been my office, and I've been running it as a general medical practice. Um, there um, have been some recent changes, and I, I, if I can lead in. Please do. Okay, well, um, so I've had a staff there, and I've done regular run-of-the-mill medical care, whether it's blood pressure or diabetes. Is uh, that like a general practice? Yeah, sore throats, you know, whatever, oh. physicals, um, immigration stuff we've done. Uh, Tell us about the immigration if you can, just then I'm curious. Well, I, I, I'll come back to that okay. perhaps. But, um, but along, uh, very recently though, and this is a, a sadness for me, and I, I, um, it's a sadness for the, the people who work for me, um, and it's, I'm, I'm sad for them. I've had to temporarily close my office. And um, well, this, yes, well, yeah, this comes out of the Board of Registration of Medicine in Massachusetts <coughs> on January 29th gave me an order of a temporary suspension of my license. So, you know, my not answering some of the medical questions centers on that. I don't want to give medical advice on the air. No, I understand um, that. But uh, it's, it's stemming from uh, most of it, most of it, most of the smoke comes from uh, what I've been doing the last eight years or so as part of my practice, a little offshoot of my practice, I have been trying to help people addicted to narcotics taper off narcotics and get their lives back. So I want people not just to be on a replacement narcotic, and the, the new one out is called Suboxone. And that's what I got a license to write separately in about 2005, what 2006. What is Suboxone, if I may? Suboxone, the generic name is buprenorphine. And I like to point that out because the orphine, buprenorphine rhymes with morphine. Right. right. And so when morphine came out 130, 40 years ago, uh, a lot of people got addicted to it. Morphine is a narcotic, an opiate, and opiates service a part of the brain that's related to pleasure. So without being too crude, you know, the orgasm, for instance, is that immediate pleasure. That's endorphins, they're called. Uh, when, when you win a race or somebody says, great job, Morris, you know, fabulous, wonderful show. The, we have a little 
kind of like burst of the pleasure molecule called endorphins. And, and the best way to get that is through work, intimacy, you know, a, I don't know, commendation, basically the things that bring societies together and bring people working together and accomplishing. So that's kind of our reward for accomplishment on one level. But being clever animals that we are, we can figure out ways to, to get those pleasures without really doing the work. And um, so there are ways of kind of short circuiting. Like, like some people will go to pornography, for instance, to try to get a pleasure rather than dating. And so which one's easier? Probably the pornography is quicker and easier. And cheaper. Yeah, but, but, but the dating's more satisfying. Right. And so people do that. They mimic that kind of choice in their life a fair amount of times, uh, our ways. And, and so you can kind of go for the real thing or the fake thing. And in a sense, the opiates become, I think people get onto them for a lot of the reasons. They're having fun. They get a pleasure. They get a relaxation. They feel good about themselves. They can talk. Uh, a lot of different things, Some, sometimes for pain, obviously, to, to alleviate pain. So that's a total, that's kind of a different avenue. But a lot of people are getting into narcotics as an offshoot of their partying, what they call, I, I was partying too much. And I understand what a party is. A party should be a reward for, you know, a week of hard work. But if you're just doing the drug, you're, you're not partying anymore because you have nothing to party from. You're just drugging yourself. And so people, because they're getting that pleasure, Sometimes they get needy to it, they get habituated to it, and if they stop it, then they go down. They don't have it. They're not making their own anymore. And um, so that's a situation that I think people are familiar with to a certain right. extent. Uh, I don't know whether you know this or not, but we do have marijuana legalized now and it's becoming a tower city. Well, that, that's, a, that's a point I, I'll get to in just one minute. I just come back to what happened to my practice. So what happened to my practice is I, I've been writing Suboxone for a long period of time, well, not long, but eight years or so. And initially, I had a little barrier to entry. I, I wanted people to have some skin in the game when they came to me. I wanted them to be sincere about really wanting to taper. Because there are a lot of pro people writing Suboxone who are writing a fair amount of it, and they're writing it probably more than the patients actually need. So there's a lot of street Suboxone being sold right now. A lot of doctors are writing two and three pills a day for people, when a, lo a lot of the patients don't really need maybe more than one. Some of them might need more than that, but there's a lot of people selling, passing them around, just like they can sell Percocets on the street. A lot of patients are getting more than they should. Um, so in my interest, I, I wanted people to be in a, a program that's not too short, so it's not three or five days, and not so long, not years. I wanted them to, to kind of like, almost like the way when you, when you break up with somebody, you fall out of love, it takes you a few months to get over it. I, I, I decided a few months was a reasonable length of time that people could kind of get their lives back and reacclimate to the world and so forth and taper off their narcotics. And so that's the program I had. And so I actually initially charged $185 per person just to, to kind of discuss the different kind of program I was doing. It, I had an administrative fee. And I, I wound up having, I think, on average, people who were more sincere about wanting that. As time went on, I was told I couldn't charge the 185 anymore. And I reimbursed the people who had, had paid it and so forth. But, but what happened is I had kind of had a lower barrier to entry. And a lot of doctors are keeping a very small stable of patients on steady amounts of Suboxone, and they're not really having any flux. They're not having any changeover, turnover. So they're kind of their hotels are full, and there's no vacancy. And so they're not taking a lot of the mass health, a lot of the lower income people into their practices. I was having more of a, I'm more like a, a bus. People come on, some people come off. So I'm kind of like traveling through, and, and I maintain more spaces for people to come on to my practice. But, but lately, a lot of people come on, and they don't necessarily want the tapering. They don't necessarily want to hear the message that I'm bringing about kind of getting back to work, getting back to family, getting back to friendships, getting back to faith, and getting back to kind of regular good time kind of fun and fulfillment. So actually, I have something called the five Fs that I think that are foundation for people's return to getting back to normal life. But along the way, um, I generated, in the, in the last four years, I generated uh, four complaints that people wrote to the state. Out about, of how many patients? If well, I in, in the course of that last four years, about maybe, uh, I don't want to do over, in the course, I, I do about maybe 300 new patients a year. So since I've been doing this, I've probably, had more, I, I've probably had more than 2,000 come through wow. my office. I'm not sure the exact number. And we haven't succeeded with everybody. You only had four? Well, yeah, the four, I know. But, 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 
but compared to the other doctors who are keeping a very small number of patients, and they're keeping them all happy by giving them as much as they want, I sometimes get people unhappy by giving them less. And I'm tapering everybody anyway, and when people come in having you know, broken the rules of the program, having done, say, heroin or something like that, while I'm supposedly treating them for detox, right. I want them to have a sense of, of, uh, of responsibility towards themselves in the program. So I, I like if, if you were cheating on a test in a class, you don't necessarily get the good grade. So I would accelerate their detox and say, look, you want to stay on this, this treatment, you have to do better. And I would try to, 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 to have some rules and structure about that. And some people are okay with that, and some people are not. I don't try to keep everybody happy, but what I didn't count on was that certain people who are unhappy enough would write these letters, and these letters would become smoke for the Board of Registration, and where they see enough smoke, they think there has to be a fire. So they started looking into my program, and they're trying to find ways that I differ from the other doctors who are prescribing, and, and I do. I'm very upfront about that. I differ from the way other doctors are writing this. I'm writing in a tapering program, and, I don't, and my general paradigm is that addiction is painful, it's, it's sad, it's horrible, it's physical, and, 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 but it's not a disease. I think I see it more of a condition and a trauma, in a sense, like breaking your leg. It's painful. It's bothering you. You're out for a while, but it can be fixed, and you can. You might break your leg again, but but you can get on from it. I don't. I don't think breaking your leg is a disease, and I don't think addiction is a disease. But I'm outside of, of what is is kind of polite medical society in a sense. And part of what's happening right now is that I'm being reprimanded in a sense, partly for that, and that's part of their list of indictment. Dr. Bach, I've got to ask you. Well, you were talking about addiction. I got a few questions. Sure. I, I just want to throw them out, and you can explain them to me. As you will. Because I know nothing about medicine. Oh, I wouldn't go that. I'm sure you don't. These are the addictions that, like smoking, alcohol, drugs, marijuana. Could you just explain a little of them? We still got sure. about seven minutes left. Sure. Um, I think I think humans are addictable. I think if we find things we like, and we do them. You know, I play squash, which is like indoor tennis, right. you know, racquetball. Yep. And I have a great time with it. I've been in leagues, and, and pretty much th three times a week for the last forever, I've been playing squash, and I get a kick out of it. I have fun. We, we, we talk afterwards. Sometimes we go out for a beer, this and that. And, and if I didn't have it, I, I'd be, I, I don't know if I would go through withdrawal, per se, but I would certainly would change my life a little bit. Frankly, leaving my office, I'm going through withdrawal because I haven't been able to work the last two weeks or so, and, and it's a sense of deep sadness for me, not being able to be at work. I, I a deep sadness for the community. Well, thank you so much. You're too kind. No, I'm not. <laughs> but go ahead. But, but, I mean, it might be a joy for some people that I'm not there. No. But who knows? But, but, but I think we, we have these things we do. And again, you could say, well, going to work for Dr. Bach, being that doctor, I'm addicted to that. Well, sure. And we understand whenever anybody um, has any kind of like unfortunate circumstance, whether it's divorce or, frankly, that with dogs we were talking about, your dog dies. I think we all go through a Depression. deep sadness. We, we have a sense of withdrawal. So we, are, I mean, I might very well be addicted to my dogs. You know, I see them every morning. They perk me up. I'm like happy. We run around, all kind of stuff. If they, if they were, weren't there, I, I think I would be immediately sad. I, I have a cat like that, Doc. Yeah, well, fair enough. I wouldn't be sad forever. Okay, and I would probably find something else over time. My feeling is that we, we get into things. I, one of my sons was way into video games, the World of Warcraft kind of thing, spending a lot of time. Nowadays, some parts of medicine are saying, well, that's a disease. Now, I don't buy that, and it's, it's like obesity. Is obesity a disease? I mean, I, I think that if you're overweight, you should fix it, you should work on it, there are issues and so forth. Uh, you could say it's your glands, your metabolism, but on some level, you can fix it if you ate less, okay, at least temporarily. I mean, Oprah, you know, does she have a disease or not? Does, I don't know. Sometimes she's gaining weight. Sometimes she's losing, losing weight. weight. So right. I know she can do either one. And even if she's more likely to be obese than, than somebody else, clearly there are things she can do about it. And so let's, I, I'll grant that some people are more likely to want to do narcotics or get caught up with narcotics or gambling or alcohol. But that doesn't mean they can, they don't, that, doesn't, that does not mean they cannot stop. President Bush, George W., you know, he was, I think he, he'll readily, readily admit he's an alcoholic. You know, and he was drinking, I think he admits to doing cocaine and so forth. You know, he found 
religion. He found a different way of being. And I'm not saying you have to do that for it, but, but clearly there are, there are ways. That sometimes it might take a, a, you know, a, a whole change in attitude. And he became a born-again Christian, and I'm Jewish, and I'm not Christian, but you know, I respect that, that he found a different way of being that was more respectful for the people around him and so forth. And I think that, that, that addictions are things that, that people can get into and they're things they can get out of. And it depends what your, what your wishes and desires and motivations are, what your direction is. So, you know, I, I think that the, the gambling, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to make a fair number of these things into diseases as if we can't make our choices about those things. And I understand it, it's, it's a mess if that's where you are, but I don't think it has to be that mess forever. Right, we only have about three minutes left, Dr. Buck. Please take a couple of minutes and wrap it up any way you wish. All right, well, first of all, I want to thank you for your I service. I want to thank you for coming here, and I want to thank you for your service, because you helped the community well, by healing us. Yeah, true enough, but, but you know, when we, we talk about, you know, the veterans, you were saying I'm a veteran of Revere, but, uh, but being, a vet, of a, being a veteran of a community is not the same as wearing the uniform. And, and, we and all can't your, wear the uniform, and Doc. Putting, no, not, not, yeah, I agree. I mean, I, 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 had, I was in the lottery back when I told you back when I right. was a teenager. And I, I had a, you know, a, what we called a good number. I had a, a high number, which meant you're low on the, on the picking order. Right. And so I didn't get chosen for Vietnam. But um, I, I understand, you know, the level of, of commitment and service and, and, and how much we benefit from, you know, the freedoms that, frankly, we take for granted that were, that were you know, procured and kept uh, by virtue of, of men like yourself. Thank so, you. So I, I appreciate that. And that uh, goes for all the veterans out there. Too, absolutely, the and, and a lot of them are my patients, and I, I, I tip my hat to them. And I wish I had a hat like yours, but I wouldn't wear it. Um, the, the, uh, so anyway, in conclusion, you know, I, I've enjoyed being in Revere. Uh, I'm not a perfect person. I, I uh, have had, you know, probably some uh, times where, you know, I've interacted with patients, and some of them feel as if, I have put them down and this and that, but I'm not trying to put anybody down. I'm trying to present the opportunity for them to be a better version of themselves. And sometimes, you know, actually, I'll give you one quick example. I had a guy in uh, a corrections officer, ex-corrections officer. So he, he, had, um, he had gone astray. He was, doing, he was working in the prisons, and he got too close to the prisoners, and he was doing too many favors for them, and then he started doing some of the things. Anyway. Long story short, he wound up on drugs, and I, I, my, I don't know the whole story about his job, but he lost his job. He came to me a few years later, and he was kind of down, and, and I treated him, and he wasn't doing well in my program, and I, I had to kick him off. And he and I, he, he wasn't happy about that, because, but, he, but he kept doing drugs while he was on my program. And anyway, so a few months come, went by, he comes back, and I said, hey, how you doing? He says, how are you doing? He said, I, I, I mean, last time you were here, you called me a... Uh, a bad word, a, a bleep bleep, and, and he says, yeah, you are. He says, okay, well, I still am, but I said... Excuse me, I gotta interrupt you now. Uh, gotta run it out of I gotta line. get the punchline. Okay, hurry so, so the punchline is, I said, why did you come back? He says, well, you know what? For my situation, I need a guy like you. I need a bleep bleep to get me back, get my life back. So right, Doc. I want to thank you, Dr. Randy Buck. God bless you for coming up here. I really thank you so much. That. I appreciate thank it, Mars. Thank you for coming up here. Like I say, God bless our people of Revere, our troops, and our great country, the United States of America. And before I go, you are a veteran of the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.